aviation training in Canada, a century and more. A presentation made by the Canadian Aviation Historical Society Manitoba chapter. Presenters Bill Zook and special guest Sylvia Martin presented on April 27, 2023, with an in-person program at the Royal Aviation Museum of Western Canada and via Zoom online. Bill Zook's bio. Bill is a historian with membership in a number of different organizations in Canada. An author with 10 books in publication and a filmmaker whose work is on 18 different film projects. His latest work is in Finding Amelia, Amelia Earhart in Canada. Sylvia Martin is an educator at the Winnipeg School Division. She's the coordinator of aviation and aerospace programming and aerospace manufacturing and maintenance orientation programming. Offered at Tech Vauk High School. Sylvia works with Manitoba Aerospace to promote the industry to young people. Her background is as a science teacher and guidance counselor, and her work helps young people explore careers in aviation and aerospace. I acknowledge that I live and work in Treaty 1 territory on original lands of Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. Canadian bush pilot Wap May summed up his flying he said he didn't fly in the usual way. They taught you how to fly up the field, take off and land. Once I was in the air, I, sh I would show them some fancy flying. I performed a figure eight and then landed, but in the adjoining field right side up. It was much to the astonishment of my instructor who figured we both should have been killed. Canadian aeronauts took to the skies at the dawn of the 20th century in hot air balloons. With each ascent, they gained experience and confidence. They learned how to handle and operate from each other. Most of the repair and maintenance was derived from a similar process. The pilot was often the designer and builder. The importance of training was realized, but there was very little information on aeronautics available. Others that flew birdmen and birdmen with parachutes and improvised wings and gliding and sailplanes found that their training was also rudimentary, mostly consisting of sharing experiences. Even when the first heavier than air aircraft were in the air, the pilots learned through sharing experiences with a few old hands. First form of air training came from the early days of gliding. As this later photograph shows, pilots would sit in a glider that was on the ground, pointed into a strong wind, and they could feel the controls. It gave a feel for the controls and was the earliest form of flight simulation. Pilots in training would often have to fly alongside as a passenger and observe the controls. Maintenance and repair began to be important. Flying machines were, were repaired and maintained by engineers and mechanics who came from other walks of life. But the need for training of large numbers of pilots took place in the First World War. A new discipline of aviation psychology and testing was introduced. Earlier, pilots such as Wap May and ace Billy Bishop, they were selected on the basis of their horsemanship. 
Camp Borden in Ontario was selected on January 2nd, 1917 to be a military aerodrome, first flying station of the Royal Flying Corps of Canada. Satellite fields were also set up across Canada. And in 1918, training also took place in Texas, allowing for year long training. Training for pilots started with a ground school that involved the Penguin system, clipped training aircraft that could taxi and make even little short hops, led to flights in two seat training aircraft. Mechanics and technical staff came from the same programs. But training didn't come without casualties. It was revealed that 8,000 fatalities out of a total of 14,000 pilot deaths had occurred before the pilots ever flew against the enemy. Considered an accepted price to pay in time of war. By the end of hostilities, over 20,000 Canadians had served in the Royal Flying Corps, two thirds of them being trained in Canada. During the interwar years, military and civilian schools were in operation. Camp Borden became the primary training station for the Royal Canadian Air Force. And there, technical training for boys 15 to 18 years was inaugurated in 1927. Flying clubs had started as early as 1913, but in 1927, the Canadian government realized there was a shortage of pilots, and they supported the flying clubs across Canada, much the same way as they had in uh, flying clubs had been supported in Australia and the United Kingdom. The flying clubs would operate from government-supported airports, and would receive aircraft for training. 16 clubs started in 1928 in Toronto, Saskatoon, Montreal, and Winnipeg. Those began in 1928. A further seven were added in 1929. The initial bath, batch of trainers were de Havilland Moss, but soon they were accompanied by other aircraft from de Havilland Canada, Fleet, and Curtis Reed a powerful boost to the Canadian aircraft manufacturers. In the 1930s, the first true simulator was used. Devised by Edwin Link, the Link trainer resembled a small aircraft. The pilot trainer would sit inside and learn how to fly, operate the controls and fly through a simulation of blind flight and instrument flying. The link trainer became very important as war clouds gathered. At the beginning of the Second World War, all allied nations were forced to realize that they had to train massive numbers of aviation specialists. Canada took a, on the role where the British Commonwealth Training Plan or corp incorporated 231 training sites, 10,000 aircraft, and 100,000 military personnel. As well, flying clubs, bush flying and charter companies, and the new TransCanada Airlines and Canadian Pacific Airlines also provided training for air crews. In order to produce the numbers of graduates, training units then provided the most sophisticated technologies and methodologies. They realized they, they needed skilled instructors and simulators that would help. Not only the link trainer, but the Howarden, Howarden trainer was an example of a simulator built from the center section of a Spitfire hung from a ceiling. It enabled pilots to learn how to complete a, an operational flight. Flight training was also based around purpose-built aircraft. 
both single engine and multi-engine training. British Commonwealth Air Training Plan graduated over 130,000 students in all trades and roles. Technical training took place at St. Thomas, Ontario at the School of Technical Training. Majority of those who graduated went on to serve in the Royal Air Force, but over half of them were Canadians. In 1940, a youth training program was also begun when the Air Cadet League was authorized to train young men for duties during the Second World War. A total of 29,000 Air Cadets were trained during the war years. In post-war years, the Royal Canadian Air Force provided training to the North Atlantic Treaty Organization Air Forces, graduating 4,600 pilots and navigators from 10 countries. And during the post-war period, commercial and private training continued at the flying clubs, but by the 1960s, college and university programs came in, into, into being. College programs such as those offered by the Northern, Northern Al Alberta Institute of Technology and the Seneca College of Applied Arts and Technology were the first of accredited college programs. They now offer programs that are part of the Integrated Airline Transport Pilot License Program. In peacetime, the Air Cadet program evolved. It continued to provide a program of youth training, but now there was a special emphasis on aviation, the annual awarding of gliding and power flying scholarships also increased the numbers of, of pilots in training. A number of high school programs across Canada included the TechVoc Aerospace Manufacturing, Machining and Maintenance Operation Orientation Program, AMOP, certified by the Canadian Aviation Maintenance Council. As well, in Winnipeg, the Sturgeon Heights High School provided the first private and commercial pilot ground school at a high school level. Post-war, new technologies included creating aircraft simulators pioneered by companies such as the Canadian Aviation Electronics, CAE. It produced a functioning replica of an aircraft cockpit, as well as maintaining ground control equipment. It was joined by Metronix Systems, another world-class supplier of advanced simulators. Synthetic training devices, the STDs, became more and more capable, and training was offered through the internet and other interactive systems. It provided a realistic training environment that was cost effective. Today, Canada's training in the, in the aviation field includes private trainers, college and university programs. The largest flight training institution in Canada is the Moncton Flight College, which had its origins back as, a, as an aero club. Second largest training numbers in Canada come from a group of independent flight training units at St. Andrews Airport, Manitoba. They include Harv's Air Service, Winnipeg Aviation, and Custom Helicopters. Combined total of hundreds of graduates annually, including those that are in the Air Cadet Flying Scholarship Program. Today, Canada Wings Aviation Training Center in Southport, Manitoba, services the Canadian Forces Primary Flight Training Program and NATO Flight Training. Winnipeg's Red River College, Stevenson Campus, also includes training for aircraft maintenance engineers, AMEs. 
and with the wide range of training opportunities now available, a bright future appears to ensure Canada's position as a world leader in aviation and aerospace. 